Who are we that you would be mindful of us? What do you see that's worth looking our way? We are free. Yeah. 
for the offering. Are you excited? <laughs> offering is, of course, in this COVID generation, we do it what I call African style. You must dance your way to the front where these offering plates are lovely found. And uh, if you don't know how to dance, just, you know, wiggle uh, your way up the, the aisle. When we all get to heaven will be the song. Would you stand with me? And so uh, uh, you can bring your offering plate there's one on either side up here where you can sing and dance and bring your offering because the Lord loves a cheerful giver all amen. right amen you may be seated praise God thank you for your generosity and giving and your enthusiasm and worship it feels like you're learning something praise God <laughs> praise God thank you worship team Amazing work today. Aren't, aren't they good at what they do? By the way, they do not own the corner of the market on singing or playing instruments. If you can do that, please see Miss Tanya. She will work you like a dog. <laughs> right? I, am I right? <laughs> I've watched her at work. I mean, she, she's, she's tough. She's tough. No, I, look, what we do for the Lord, we do wholeheartedly, right? Amen. So we are in this series, The Right Power, right now. Have you ever, by mistake, maybe, maybe I'm the only moron, maybe I should keep this to myself, but put the wrong fuel in some sort of motor device, Maybe diesel, 
I guess I'm the only moron. But, but if you get the wrong stuff, it won't work. It may smell like it. It may look like it. But it's the wrong stuff. And it will mess up your engine and mess up the whole thing. And they'll have to go through this great procedure to get your car fixed or whatever. But I, wh why do I bring this up? The enemy of our soul comes to deceive, steal, kill, and destroy. So his mode of operation is he's got no real gain. All he's got is counterfeit to offer. And if he has counterfeit to offer, it would be like you and I going to pay our bills with Monopoly money and just smiling ear to ear. Here, I've got my mortgage for you. They will look at you like, what are you on, ma'am, sir? We cannot accept your monopoly money to pay for your mortgage. It is not. But the enemy of our soul is doing the exact thing to us. No matter what the situation might be, he is serving up counterfeit things, a counterfeit power that may say suffice for the moment, but the long term will be your destruction. Are you with me? Are you alive in church? Nudge somebody and say, I think he's about to preach. I think he's about to unload. He may have had a coffee or two this morning. I think he's ready. So the reality is that we all have issues. Correct? All right. Thank God. Thought we were in a room full of liars there for a minute. We're going to have an altar call, right? A problem solving. Anybody ever have to solve a problem, solve an issue? All right, now problem solving is this multi-level intellect thing that has to happen for all of us. There are steps in the procedure. If you went to school and have an education, you may have learned about the scientific method, about identifying the problem, and then... Do I have any educated people in the house? I feel like I'm talking to myself. I'm going to just preach over here in the corner. So, you know, the scientific member, remember all that? Solving these problems. But the reality is that sometimes we fall short. Our best idea to solve the problem, whatever it might be, just seems to fall short. And so I was listening to the Joy FM and this this woman that, that seemed to, you know, they have that DJ voice, like they've been doing this for years. They're just as smooth as can be. And this lady's on there describing that she grew up having to go through years of speech therapy. And as it comes out of her mouth, I'm thinking, no way. She is so smooth. She's got this. She knows exactly what she's doing. But she's giving her testimony right there on the air. That I am a DJ for Joy FM. And I thank God that he called me here. But it wasn't always that way. There was a moment I couldn't even get the words out right. Come on, somebody. I couldn't even speak. I couldn't even talk. I couldn't get it right. And she said she was on the air and heard herself, although trained, although using the English language perfectly well and having that smooth DJ voice, she heard herself slip back into the old way of talking and embarrassed herself on live air. And she said, I thought about resigning right then and there, saying to myself, you're not capable, you're a failure, you'll never be anybody, Come on. Yeah. She, she's already arrived at where she needed to be. And where did the devil want to take her? You're a failure. And you know what she did in that moment? She did not go back to speech therapy. She said this. God, if you don't do this, I cannot do this. What? A theologian works at Joy FM.
This woman realized that if God doesn't somehow come through, my best effort will surely bring me failure. And then there's going to be some evil soul pointing at me every step of the way, telling me how wrong and how great of a failure I am. And depending on where you're at spiritually, you just might swallow that hook, line, and sinker and become less than who God intended you to be. Are you alive? I promise this is going to be a good sermon. So whenever we have problems, there's a handful of things we human, human beings do. So, some of us are just hit with stuff. And we, we say to ourselves, I don't, I don't have a problem. It is the proverbial ostrich head in the sand motive of, you know what? Compared to other people, I really don't have a problem. I just need to shut up about what's going on in my life. I really don't have a problem. I'm okay. And they bury their head in the sand. Do you know anybody like that? Don't point at them. Just say, I, I acknowledge that is a reality. There is a second thing that when problems hit people, there is a, another thing that people love to do. And I don't know why they love to do this, but I've watched it over and over and over again is they live under the debilitating power of the situation. And then they have to deal with the outcome of just living under debilitating power. And perhaps, I'm not making fun of anybody, but when that happens, why knees is the language they speak. Because it's never gonna go right, it's never gonna be right, nobody likes me, Everybody hates me. I think I'll go eat. Hey, you read that, read that book, Worms. And, and when you are in that mode of operation, depression is not far behind. If I've studied the human capacity long enough, suicide is right next door. Crouching at the door of the individual that says, you'll never get out from underneath of this. It is too debilitating for you. You will never overcome this situation. Except our Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So there, there, there are people that do that. They just live under the debilitating power of the situation. There is a third group of individuals who are quite uh, intellectual. They will estimate the problem, they will see what is going on with the situation, and they will come up with a multitude of answers in which to solve the problem. And most of the world, we would say, out of the three, they are probably the smartest and most successful people on the planet. We would say that the person who buries themselves or uh, in the sand or the person who lives under the debilitating power of the situation, we would say in a cultural sense, those people are failures. This person at least is acknowledging the problem and trying to fix the situation. Now remember, we're in a series about the right power right now. What if there's a fourth way? that cannot be arrived at in a general, everyday, human capacity. Well, what if there is a fourth way that can only be discerned supernaturally? I thought I was in a Pentecostal church for a moment. <laughs> I'm talking about have you ever got an idea worked through a scenario and said to yourself, I couldn't have thought this up. There is no way I have the capacity nor the intellect to even know that there was a problem, yet God is showing me how to fix the problem, and how can I even do this except that I hear from God? All right, we are in church, right? We hear from God, and God speaks to me, and he walks Come on, sing with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share 
as we take it. None other has ever. That's a great tune, right? I come to the garden alone. You think about the reality of Jesus being in the garden alone when he's talking and thinking through the reality of his own crucifixion on the cross. God, is there some other way? Why is crucifixion your idea? It hurts. It's going to be an abysmal, painful experience. Can you take this cup from me? And he walks. And by the time he's done talking with you, you say, nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. So what if God has ideas for you in which to solve problems that you have not even begun to think about? Because his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And the only way that we can get up in there to get those thoughts is we've got to get our worship on. I come into his gates with thanksgiving. I come into his courts with praise. And there are some people that say, I'm not going to embarrass myself at church with that whole dance thing and worship thing and raising my hand thing. And I'm saying, you're denying yourself access to the one who will give you the knowledge, the wisdom, and the input to make decisions far above your capacity. I thank God for that ability, because if you only had my intellect, oh Lord, where would we be? I'm not trying to brag at all except on God. But I was working with the church, and we came out with a strategy along with the board to salvage this church that was absolutely dying. I wrote out what I believe the Lord gave me and brought it to the board, and we began to implement this. After implementing it, one of the guys on my board slammed a book down in front of me, and he said, when did you read this book? It was a book authored by a, a student from Harvard about how to run a proper economy from a business perspective. I said, I never read that book. I am terrible at business, but I know the one who holds the whole world in his hands. His intellect is far beyond mine, but if I ask him, he'll reveal things to me and we can walk this channel with the Almighty. Are you alive this morning? Nudge somebody and say, I think the caffeine is cooking his brain. This reality, most people, that if they sat across the table with you and you thought problem solving with them and you say, you know, I'm not avoiding the subject, neither am I going to live under the debilitating power of it. I have not come up with any ingenious ideas on my own. I prayed about this. And this is what I believe God is telling me to do. Now, I know that I've used this illustration already with the stick, the sling, and the shadow. But I, I want you to go back there with me and think of the reality of how Moses' stick solved a multitude of problems. An army marching up on you and a Red Sea in front of you, and the solution is a stick. God, that's nuts! Raise my stick over the water? Woo! -hoo! It seems ludicrous. It seems ludicrous that a giant, some nine feet tall, and a young boy stands there with a slingshot, claiming to have killed a bear and a lion with his bare hands, and this giant shall fall like them. And the king, the most powerful man in the land, says, Go ahead. Go ahead. And David runs out on the battlefield and takes care of business. And you think, in, in what capacity is that even, where does that work? God has a healing crusade and nobody prays, nobody, there's no anointing oil. 
it's Peter in his shadow. And the guy just walks through and his shadow falls on people and they start getting released from demons. They start rising up from their afflictions. And you say to yourself, where does that ever work? We got a pandemic, Lord. Let's just cast our shadow on people. But no, we've got all these other ideas about how to handle the pandemic because we got a bunch of smart people that think they know. But the reality, that is not, in, uh, I'm sorry, I'm rude. All I'm trying to say is, why don't we talk to God, the right power right now to deal with whatever I'm going through? Because I feel like even the modern church, he is the last resort. I'll try everything else. In fact, I've heard people come up to me, I've tried everything, pastor. Why don't we pray? <laughs> we got prayer cards, all right? If you're in it, just fill it out and say, would you pray with me? Don't, don't wait on the most significant answer of your life when he is right there. He is present at all times. He will never leave you. He will not forsake you. The reality of the presence of God is at all times. I hear you. I'm walking with you. And if I'm not going to solve it the way you think I'm going to solve it, relax. What, what do we say uh, these days? Breathe. Just breathe. It's going to be all right. He's walking this road with you. I think of Daniel, who was told he was not allowed to pray. And the reality was, he said, I don't care what you do to me. I cannot stop talking to God. And so knowing the solution would be, they're going to throw me in the lion's den, I'm going to keep on talking to God. Which says to me something, that if government comes down and says you can't talk to God, which it could happen at some future point in time, don't you worry. You keep talking to God. God can do some miracles to deliver you through some stuff that you didn't think could happen. They're going to feed me to hungry lions, Lord. Don't you know that I can shut the mouth of lions? And when they throw those who accused you in, I think I'll make the hungry lion appear. All right. I can see you all think I'm crazy. So, What if the right power right now it's an effective understanding that God already knows what you need. Philippians chapter 4, part 19 says, My God shall supply all your needs according. Oh, I thought it was according to your problem. My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. That's Philippians 4.19. Now, what if the only way you could obtain that was by supernatural means? You do not submit a request in a paper format to God where you say, God, all right, uh, I need a requisition for uh, finances to pay this. But what, what if you don't even really bring up the finances? What if you just walk this journey with God and, and you're talking about your need and he says, I want you to give? He said, oh, God, I think you misunderstood. I need money. And he says, back to you, I think you need to give more in the offering. Now, God, I, I need the cash. Yes, I heard you. Give in the offering. God, you really have a hearing problem. How old are you anyway? I have the money problem. Yeah, I heard you. Give. Give, and it shall be given to you. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running. The right power right now is not always right, easily seen in front of you. Sometimes you have to back away and say, all right, God, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, and how do you want to do this? So I want to take you to the book of Zechariah. As an outcome of this sermon, I would love for people to be able to be properly, properly equipped to face whatever dilemma, problem, situation 
however debilitating it might be, with an understanding that it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by the Spirit of God that things get done. So let me walk you into Zechariah chapter number 4. The context is this. This book generally in the Old Testament is all about the Israelite family. How they came about, how they traveled together, how they were in bondage together, how they were released from Egyptian uh, bondage, and how they uh, moved into the promised land that God gave them, and then how they began to move into idolatry and witchcraft and a bunch of other things, and became enslaved all over again to another nation. In this case, in this point of history, it would have been the Babylonians. The Babylonian Empire was rich and powerful at this particular time in history, of which I told you Daniel lived under that Babylonian Empire. But it would soon be taken over by the Medo-Persian Empire. Babylon to the Medo-Persian Empire, and that's the point in history in which we find ourselves in this text. Under the media Persian Empire, those who had been living in Babylonian captivity were beginning to go back to Israel. When they got there, if you can imagine this, Israelites who had been living in slavery and bondage to another nation are saying, you guys can go back home. And they get home and their houses have been burnt to the ground. I mean, can you imagine thinking, I'm going home! And you walk down your street and you're like, oh God, what happened here? Every house has been burned to the ground. Our fields that were rich in produce have been burned. Our animals, our agricultural nation, our animals have been slaughtered. It's nothing but death and destruction in every direction. How depressed are you when you have this initial excitement, I'm going home. Oh my God, what happened to my home? You've got a problem. So they, they sashay down the road in depression and they arrive at the house of God and find it in shambles too. What are we going to do? I thought we could at least go to the church. I thought we could at least go worship God and figure something out here. But the house of God lies in ruins too. And instead of fixing their homes and fixing the church, they let it sit there in, ru in ruins for 13 years. Ostrich head meets sand. <laughs> Maybe the house will just grow itself one day. Maybe the produce will just start coming around. Maybe the house of God will just build itself. So we come to the prophet Zechariah. And Zechariah has been bombarded with questions. People have questions. Where is God in the middle of this disaster? Zechariah, you're a godly man. Why don't you pray and ask God, what in the world is going on here? And that's what the book of Zechariah is all about. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 4. Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man who is wakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? So what is happening? This man, Zechariah, is having a dialogue with God and God's about to reveal an answer to deliver to the people about the destruction of their homes and in more particular, the destruction of the temple and what to do about it. So don't you want to be in a front row seat with Zechariah seeing the vision about how God's going to fix it? That'd be pretty awesome, right? If we could all just get sucked up into the vision. Zechariah, what did you see? Do tell. What did you see? So I said, I'm looking, and there is a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it, and the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to seven lamps. So what does he see, church? Remember, he's an Israelite. What is a seven-lamp 
oil, a menorah. He sees the Hanukkah menorah, the traditional Israeli menorah. He says, I'm, I'm up in heaven, God, and, and I see it. I see a menorah. I don't get it. Our houses have been burnt to the ground. You're showing me candles? Come on, God. Have you ever felt that way? God, I've got real stuff going on. What is this? Maybe I'm the only reprobate that reads the Bible this way, but look. What, 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 is, what, you, what is this? He continues, two olive trees are by it. One at the right of the bowl and the other at its left. So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked with me saying, what the heck are these? Come on, can you get there with the prophet? What? What is this? This does not even begin to touch the problem. What is this? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? Have you ever felt like you weren't in on the, the joke? He's asking the angel, what in the world is this? You, you don't know? Like, this is the answer, dude. This is it, man. This is it. And you're like, I, I'm lost. A lamp, trees, oil, bowls. Make a salad? Have a birthday party? I, I'm lost. I, I, don't, I don't know. So I said, no, I, I, don't, I don't get it, my Lord. So he answered and said to me, this, the menorah, the lamps, the trees, the oil, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Of course I should have arrived there. I don't know how I didn't arrive there, angel, but I didn't arrive there, did you? Your house is burned down, your village is burned down, the temple is burned down, and you're showing me trees. You're showing me lamps, and you're telling me this vision is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, a political leader of that time, saying, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Oh, what? I, I, what do you mean, Lord? If I could wax eloquent for you for just a moment... I believe what God is saying is the light of this menorah is sourced supernaturally by trees that produce oil that flow into the bowls, that flow into the lamps, and the lights never go out. Say it another way. Have you ever met people and you've said to yourself, the lights are on, but nobody's home? <laughs> Am I rude? I'm trying not to be rude. But there's just some people, you look at them and you're like, make fly. <laughs> Would you breathe on this mirror? I'm not, I'm not sure... If God can supernaturally provide the anointing oil from a tree without the, the means of some man doing the production of the oil, he says, I've got the tree and I've got the flame and the only thing in between is a bowl. I think God is saying... I, I've got your situation under control. My anointing is so strong that I don't need your manpower in between. 
I can produce oil from the tree myself and put it in the bowl and flow into the lamp and it will never run out. God always has enough anointing and solution to handle your problem. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by his spirit that the whole village will be built up and the temple will be rebuilt. Verse 7. Is that where we're at? Yes. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Said another way, no weapon formed against you, Israel, will prosper. You are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ your Lord. Although there are going to be trying and difficult times that come against you, who can possibly rejoice against you even if they take all your stuff, burn all your stuff, and knock it all down? They can't take your relationship with Jesus Christ. The promise is, don't worry about your stuff. You're coming to live with me anyway. The shouts of joy will be bring out the capstone and shout grace, grace to it. The intention of heaven is we need the temple back because Messiah is going to walk into it and minister one day. So this temple will not lie in ruins as you think it to be. It has been some 13 years, and you haven't even laid a finger to do anything about it. But I'm going to raise a political leader in your time. His name will be Zerubbabel, and he will do the work. But it won't be by might. It won't be by power. He will do it by the hand of Almighty God. And if you think with me about how the temple got built in the first place, God provided skilled artisans that he gave gifts and abilities to build it in the first place. And the people came and brought all the supplies. And they worked together to get the job done. And what is God saying? If I can build it right the first time, I can certainly rebuild what the enemy has tried to destroy. Grace. Grace. You see, because if some enemy knocks down everything you have, I think most of us want to stare at the enemy and think about how many ways we can throat punch them. Get back at them for what they did to us. And God says, don't worry about them. I've already taken care of that. I have grace enough for you to get the job done. Keep your eyes on the prize. Punch somebody, I mean, nudge somebody next to you and say, I think... I think this is the right power. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall finish it. I mean, it's one thing to start something. It's quite another to finish the job. And it's one thing if we down here on earth talk about, oh, Zerubbabel, what a great leader. I'm sure he's got lots of good plans. It's quite another when heaven has a discussion that says, listen, I don't care what you think of Zerubbabel. Maybe you think he's a complete moron, but I'm going to use him to start and finish this job. And it all comes out of a vision where you have to have a conversation to figure out what the vision's about so that you can carry out the will of God. Otherwise, you stand there stupefied and say, I don't get it. Are you willing to tarry in the presence of God and say, God, I might not get it, but if you reveal it to me, I'll do it. And then he starts to bring clarity. Don't you know what it is? No, Lord, but if you tell me, I will. It's not by might. It's not even by power. It's by my spirit you get stuff done. Verse 10. For who has despised the day of small? Come on. It might look small now. 
Let's even talk about Calvary. It might be the smallest, most insignificant church in this town. We don't despise the day of small beginnings. We work with what we got. We stay on our knees. We pray to God, ask him what's next, and we just keep doing what's next. We just keep doing what's next. And one day, we're going to be old and wrinkled. And there's going to be a group of young people on some platform in a building that ain't even been built yet. Dancing and worshiping the Lord, and we're going to stand, we didn't worship like that in our day. <laughs> Look at these darn kids, making a mockery of the house of God. <laughs> and they're, they're <laughs> isn't it fun to be in church? But, and they're going to be worshiping the Lord, and they're going to be bringing their friends in because the vision that God gave Calvary is that heroin has a stranglehold on our town, and we can't let it win. So we're going to build a solution for the young people to come off the streets and live a life that glorifies God and bypass addiction and bypass uh, prison and bypass all of that and give them a life worth living. And we don't despise, we don't despise the day of small beginnings. We say it's got to start somewhere. And it starts by saying, all right, the church at Calvary is trying to figure out the right power right now. And we could on our best day sit in little circles about how, what is the most genius way to solve this problem. But it's not by might. It's not by our intellect. It's not by our scruples. It's not even by meeting the most powerful person that we think could handle the problem. You know what it is? It's hearing from the Spirit of God and saying, this is how I will build it. Calvary, all you have to do is walk it out. And so as, I, as I've been walking this out, I'm telling you, I was one of those people that prayed last. I was trying to meet with politicians. I was trying to meet with leaders. I was trying to do all these things that I thought were powerful and quick solutions. And God slammed the door in my face so many times. I said, God, what is it? What, what are we supposed to do here at Calvary? And he spoke to my heart and said, be good stewards of what I already gave you. Man, I should have thought of that. <laughs> if you take care of what you got, he can give you more. But if you don't walk with the Lord and hear that, you keep pushing other solutions. And all the angels in heaven say, what the heck is he doing, Lord? What is he doing? Doesn't he see the menorah? Doesn't he see the anointing? Doesn't he see that you don't work that way? You work this way? And he says, I know, boys. We'll get it in his head one day. We'll get it in his head one day. And when we get it in his head, it'll drop to his heart. And he'll start to talk with people. And I'll send him a pastor from Oklahoma that'll work his tail off on a Saturday afternoon. I, I, I didn't have that in my repertoire. Eddie actually had to tell me it yesterday. He's like, you know, Kevin was sent here by God, don't you? I'm like, yeah, I do now. But sometimes we can miss the solution, and it's, it's right there in the parking lot. You can miss that God's up to something, handling positional things, just strategic things that you just got to keep doing. Don't despise the small things. These are what draw you close to him. Never let you go. Lay it all down again. Hear you say that. I'm your friend. Do you want to be drawn close to the Lord? So that he whispers and you're like, I hear that. Sister Tanya, would you come? Then I answered and said to him, what, what are the two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and its left? And I further answered and said, what are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes? from which the golden oil drains. Then he answered and said, Do you, you, you don't know what these are? No, no, my Lord. So he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand before the Lord. 
of the whole earth. You see, in the, in the house of God, we have access to the anointing of God. The anointing of God, according to Psalm 133, it is God's approval that he chooses a man that we might say, why did you choose him? He says, that's none of your business. And the anointing oil is poured down on the head of Aaron and it runs down upon his beard and down onto his garments. And you know, when the anointing oil is on you and running like that, it's not like you can say, oh no, I'm not anointed. Oh yeah, you are. The stuff is oozing all over you, dude. In the days of Israel, it was clear who the anointed were because they just dumped the oil on them. Nowadays, it's just, we're not sure. We don't know who's who. We don't know who the real deal is, who the frauds are. I, I think what we've got to do is get a hold of what heaven sees. And we ask God, God, what, what, what is this you're showing me? And he says, I'm showing you the anointing. They stand before God and they deliver solutions, anointed solutions, answers that will flow from heaven to earth if you've got time for God. The right power right now. I kind of grew up in church. I, got a, I, I, I have a hymn book in my head. I've got choruses. On Sunday night, we would drop all the, the lines of the, the verses of the song and sing only choruses on overhead projectors. Does anyone know what an overhead projector even is? And we would shine words on backwards on the screen and somebody would have to flip it over and it would be upside down. You have to spin it. Oh God, bless the, bless the person doing the music tonight. But I remember on Sunday nights, the song was a staple at our church. And it was, I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice. Because you can't begin to problem solve at this level until you fall in love with him. So if you don't know this song, I invite you to learn it. We're going to sing this chorus a couple times. If you do know it, would you just sing it out to the Lord and just let him know that you love him that you cherish Him, that you want to walk with Him, that you want to hear from Him, that you want to receive from Him, that you want to carry out His will by the power of His Spirit, not by your might and power. Would you stand with me all over the house today?